Davis, uh, Smith, um, they're going to join us. Folks, uh, the last meeting, everyone, um, for those of us who have not met, met yet, we hope to spend a little time with them. Um, they've got 30 minutes um, here. They've got other 30 minutes to do. So um, ask them to join it. And, and, and Thorsten, if maybe you could sort of set it up for the, for, for the, the two, and then we can have a chance to. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, so we got uh, Todd Ackerroth here, Andy also from Oregon Design, working with Todd uh, on the golf course uh, uh, architect side. And we also got David here, David Smith from PPI. David is our um, owner representative, project manager, and is, is connecting all the pieces uh, that surround the golf course renovation. And perhaps it'd be good for David to start giving us a brief overview, and then we're going to turn it over to Todd and Andy <clears throat> to answer any particular questions to to the design and other thoughts that you may have regarding the golf course. But David, why don't you start and give us a brief overview uh, what you do, when you come into play, what we've accomplished so far. Yeah, thank you, uh, T. Allen. Uh, good morning. Uh, I think it's gentlemen, but if it's not, I can't exactly see ladies and gentlemen, perhaps. Um, yeah, no. with, <laughs> with me uh, today is uh, Tom Stevens, who's Tom Stevens, who's um, one of our project managers uh, with Golf Projects International. Um, uh, in, in three minutes or less, um, Golf Projects International has been around since 1990. Um, we are a golf course development company uh, and we do obviously golf course renovations and we have uh, a marketing component to our, our, our company and a management component. Um, we are very grateful and appreciative of the opportunity at Sharon Heights. Uh, we engaged with you in February earlier this year. And uh, prior to that, um, we'd done most of our work internationally, um, some 70 projects in 20 plus countries over the years since 1990. Um, but uh, obviously things changed with COVID and we've been more domestic in the last couple of three years. And we renovated Hillcrest Country Club that many of you may know down in um, our, uh, Los Angeles. Um, we've uh, completed Rancho Santa Fe, which is in San Diego. David Kidd was the project, uh, excuse me, the architect down there. We're currently just finishing the construction of a new golf course in Thermal, California with Gil Hands, which is out here near La Quinta, which is where Tom and I are speaking to you from today. Um, uh, when, our role for you, as TL said, is to be your owner representative, project manager, uh, to facilitate a smooth, uh, a smooth process for you all uh, using our relationships within the industry. We've, we've worked with many, many architects, obviously most construction companies, um, most irrigation companies. And um, uh, basically our process starts with the planning so when we came to you in February early this year and looked at the scope of work, one of our immediate reactions was we need to bring an agronomist into this project and we need to bring a soils scientist and a professor of soils because the original plan was to rototill a couple of inches of sand into the profile, um, which would be great if you were looking to create a tennis court um, because it would effectively create rock. Um, so we brought in Mark Mahadi, who I've worked with for years, um, who's based actually in Northern California and is an agronomist of great acclaim and, and, and very, very talented. We brought in Chuck Dixon, who I call the professor of soils. Um, they came in, they did soils tests. We sent them off to the lab, which was the genesis of sand capping. Um, so through the process of planning, um, we speak, uh, Tom and I speak to the task force of Mr. Duncan, Mr. Wozniak, Mr. Steve Smith, and TL on a weekly basis. Chad joins those calls and we go through a myriad of things in the planning and we'll be doing so on a weekly basis from now up until we start construction. And then of course, we'll be meeting in person more frequently. So through the planning process, um, you know, we talk about delivery of sand. We talk about the city permitting process. We talk about best practices of construction, which are obligations of the state. We're corrowing the fairways in the rough, which is a, a process which basically we're taking the top of the fairways off, uh, the, the, uh, the grass off the top of the fairways, and we're bringing in the sand cap, and we're using that materials from the fairways in the rough, which is a, a process that we discussed for about a month to arrive at what we consider to be a responsible and, and, and financially feasible approach to the grassing plan. 
Um, we talk about cart paths. Uh, we talk about options of cart paths, colors of cart paths, rolled curves, square curves. And really at the end of the day, we're an encyclopedia to be re as reference. And you know, we're the go-to uh, place for you as a club to say, when you talk bunker liners, what is the difference between capillary concrete, better billy bunker, flex gate, um, uh, uh, sand mat, uh, polylast, et cetera. Our job is to provide you that information for you to make a decision. And if we're asked for a recommendation, we certainly will give it. So with that being said, um, you know, after we've uh, moved through the planning process and during the planning process, um, we've negotiated the contracts. We have everybody with the exception of Landscapes Unlimited who are the contractor we're looking to do the corrowing under contract. Um, uh, Todd, who's on the, co the phone today, is, uh, is, is, is uh, fully engaged, as is Total Turf, who is the golf course construction company. Uh, we have a tree vendor who's responsible to remove the trees and to chip the trees and to remove the tree stumps. Uh, we have an irrigation company uh, called Integrity, who will be responsible for installing golf course and landscape irrigation and the landscape materials. Uh, we brought into a, the, 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 uh, the project a company which we've worked with for years in their Southern California base called Cunningham, who have been out and individually tagged the 208, excuse me, 209 trees that we're going to be planting to mitigate the, uh, uh, the tree obligations to the city of Menlo Park. Um, they are particularly capable of finding 60 inch trees that should really be in 70 and 72 inch boxes. And uh, I think we've saved a lot of money and there's a lot more supply down in Southern California of big trees, specimen trees than there are in Northern California. Um, and even though you take into account the trucking, um, overall we get a much, much better product at a better price by going through the Cunningham process. So that's kind of our role and responsibility. We, we've done a lot of work on trees because as you may know, the club has got about a $1.6 million obligation to remediate um, and replace trees. And there's a cost of a tree, there's a cost to plant the tree, and then there's the credit you get back from the city of Menlo Park. So we've, we've spent an inordinate amount of time, and Tom has kind of led this part of the process, um, uh, and uh, spent an inordinate amount of time trying to figure out what the best uh, fixing the Rubik's Cube of what, what are the best trees to buy for the best uh, project that Todd is designing, along with the landscape designer Pinnacle, um, to give us the, boast, the, the best tree with the most credit from the city. So I think we've really kind of got there now. Um, the other thing I should share with you is uh, Rochelle Rockney is our project finance manager for this project. She's in my office in Los Angeles, and um, she is involved in a very a uh, capable and careful process that we've used for years on how to make sure we stay on budget. So we've worked with TL and the team and Stephanie, your controller, um, to create the budget. Um, I think we've, uh, uh, we, we've, we've uh, done a good job. I think the budget is very, very accurate. I think we've got a sufficient contingency and um, we have a very organized process of vendors uh, sending invoices through our office before they come to your uh, accounting department to be uh, to, to be settled. Um, so with that being said, um, uh, one thing that we do after, of course, we've got all of our contracts in place, um, we have pre-construction meetings, uh, we then manage the process of construction, because lots of things happen in the field, and therefore we're obligated to help make those decisions with Todd and his team. And typically what we do is we continue to have a relationship with the club through the grow-in period because typically when you finish a project of this nature, there are 200 things on the punch list that have to get taken care of over time. Uh, and that typically runs through about a year's period. So we'll be with you uh, for the duration for as long as you invite us. Uh, again, uh, Tom is on the phone today. Uh, Rochelle uh, is, is part of the team and um, we're delighted and happy to feel any questions that might come from the group. Okay.
thanks for the overview, David. I think we can, uh, we're ready to turn it over to Todd. I'm sure there's more questions. Okay, then, then I yield my five minutes to Mr. Eckenrode. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was, that was great. I'm certainly not prepared to, uh, to, to talk as long and as in detail as you did, David. That was great. You covered most everything. Um, of course, Azure Architects, we're going to, you know, handle our role, which is, you know, starts in the beginning when we design things on paper. And the purpose of that more than anything is to run a bid and to quantify everything. And then of course we go into construction where it's really more of an art form than it is uh, a literal build it by plan kind of a process in golf course architecture. That's a key distinction that everyone should understand. It's, it's not building a commercial building or anything like that. Um, everything has to happen in the dirt. That's how we achieve the best result, the best golf course for you at the end of the project. Um, so the plans are a guideline and uh, we're gonna be out there a lot and we really wave our arms a lot and draw things in the dirt with sticks and do all that sort of stuff that communicates to the builder and to the shapers how we want it to finish. So um, we're looking forward to that process and uh, you know, we think the, the sky's the limit for Sharon Heights. So we're very excited to be uh, involved in the project. That was short and sweet. If there are any, uh, any questions at all, we'd, we'd certainly welcome them. Hey, Todd, I think an area that might be helpful for you to talk about a little bit more in detail would be the, the actual shapers and the, the work that they do and, and how you interact with them and exactly what it is that they do. Yeah, that's great. I'm not sure how much the, the group understands the process. Um, so I think that would be helpful. So the shapers are key individuals who um, are the ones on the bulldozers, on the excavators that are building the key features. And we, when we talk about key features, they're tees, greens, bunkers, that sort of thing. Um, shapers will, whether they're a, a low level shaper or a high level shaper, they're going to touch everything. Um, but those are the features we really focus on. Obviously, those are the most important to the end product, the end design. Um, and so uh, these are very talented individuals who are used to this dialogue and back and forth with the architects. They work with a, a variety of architects, so they're very capable of um, grasping, you know, the concepts that a, that a certain architect is going for and, and running with it. They're not sort of um, the, the key shapers, the ones we try to work with, of course, have that flexibility and that creativity so that they're not just doing things one way, like they would for uh, one particular architect. So they're very talented, very artistic people um, to the extent that we could say, oh, go, go make it look great and I'll show up in a month and they would. And that's not what we're going to do, but that's how talented they are. So um, we'll give them initial direction. We'll let them have their way, you know, and, and give it a go at what they interpret what we're saying. And then there's an editing process from there. Sometimes it's a, whoa, that's really not what we're going for. Let's start over. Um, but usually uh, there's, they're getting it right away. And as we build through the project, of course, it just gets more and more efficient. Um, and so it's a wonderful back and forth dialogue that we have with the shapers. And it's, it's the most important thing in my mind to how it, the golf course finishes artistically, how it looks and how it plays and all that. Um, and, and I'm talking artistic visions and all that sort of stuff, but it really also comes down to, um, uh, you know, details on the ground. When we're building greens, we're down to a tenth of a tenth of a foot, and we're really rough shaping with these guys. But then at the end of the process of layering that green up, we're down to where we're going for very distinct percentages of one percent, two percent, things that your eye really can't see. Um, but these these uh, people have a have a way of uh, delivering that, you know, even without equipment. And then we we get even more refined, and we get out the lasers, and we really start to dial it in. So that's kind of the process: is you start really big and grandiose and and rough in the rough shaping, and you work your way with these these uh, individuals all the way down to the minute details of finishing the, the, the feature that I talked about. Uh, quick follow on to that point. I think one of the quintessential pieces here will, uh, speaking of shaping, getting the contour of our greens optimized so, so that they're, they're exciting greens for the spectrum of our membership. Um, is there a role for this committee to have any feedback in that process? I know we're ways away from that. But <clears throat> how does that process unfold? Sure. Is that an iterative process? Because like we, I just know too many courses that have really tripped up when they've designed their greens and put themselves in 
really poor greens have taken away from overall nice changes to course designs. Yeah, that's it's a good it's a good question. You know, we haven't gone down that road too often um, to where we uh, are delivering anything that's you know really out of what the expectations of the club are expecting. I can't think of many instances whatsoever. We've rebuilt one green in 20 years that we originally designed <clears throat> where we were asked to come back and, hey, that was a little wild. Let's tone it down. Um, and so I, I don't think that that's, should be too much of a worry. We know the, um, but on the flip side, we don't want to create anything that's too boring either. Right. Um, it wants to be an exciting golf course. Um, so, you know, I think just a general guideline from the committee would be good of, of goals and what you're going for in the greens in in buzzwords, you know, so to speak, I'll know where to take it from there. Um, and when I talked about these percentages, we also know with the current bent grass screens, what they need to be, you know, um, they need to be at a certain percentage to get hole locations, anything over that percentage, let's call it 3% just for ducks. Um, you start to really lose hole locations and things get too steep. So, uh, eventually we're going to get sort of scientific with it down at the, at the finish there. Um, but in the rough shaping, we absolutely need to be creating a look and a feel that's generally what we're going to be layering up and, and finishing at. So that, that's very important. Yeah, following up on that, how are you thinking about the bunkering around the greens too? Because we have many holes where you have a green that has a small opening and a bunker right behind the green with a downhill lie. Yeah. So very difficult, you know, for sure. everyone. So I see you. Yeah. I, I don't have the plan in front of me, but I would venture to guess we have less back bunkering than you currently have on the plan. And when we do provide it, um, I'm not a huge fan of back bunkering for that reason. But yet I grew up learning the game and learning design at Post Tempo when Alistair McKenzie did a lot of that. So I'm a little conflicted, I guess you'd say. Um, but um, when we do build them, because sometimes they are important to stop a shot or to frame a view or, or what have you, be part of the composition of the bunkering that we have in the front, um, they can be important or to break up a big bowl in the back like you might have behind, you know, four and 16, that kind of thing. Um, we do want to build them so that they're way more playable than what you have today. So how we do that is we set the floor at, you know, just barely below the back of the green, let's call it a foot. Um, if not close to the elevation of the green. So that there's a very mild walk in uh, and you're not down in a hole. Um, and then we also build the floor so that it's as flat as can be. Uh, and if, at the end, if not ramped up towards the green. Um, the hardest part of those back bunkers is when they're built in a way that the down slope is so severe that you really can't pop the ball up no matter what. So that's, that's kind of a key uh, to, to building those in a playable way. Todd, I was gonna ask a question and the, the subject came up about green contours and there's been a few renovations in our area that you're probably familiar with Menlo Country Club and the Dunes mm -hmm. Great Peninsula, which I both think, uh, my personal opinion is the greens are really crazy on those two courses and Menlo's are going to redo some of the greens and the Dunes Court and Warrior Peninsula, I don't even enjoy playing. Uh, so I don't know what your, how do those greens compare if you've seen them to what your thought process is? Yeah, I would agree. I think we'll be a little more toned down than those. I've only seen Menlo once, so I couldn't tell you what X green looks like, you know, going, I just buzzed around in a cart since the renovation. I mean, um, and I haven't seen the, the, the dunes course since the renovation, but I've heard that. And I know they've rebuilt a whole lot of those greens um, just from talking in the industry. So yeah, I don't think that's going to be a worry that we're going to have anything that extreme. That's for sure. That's good. Hey, uh, Todd, I, I have a question though, because you mentioned Pasa Tiempo and they're going to be redoing their greens. Right. I think they're lasering all their greens and they're going to try to duplicate what mm -hmm. they do exactly um, as much as possible. But we've all, a lot of us love our greens because they're tricky, but not crazy. Um, and so what, how, what's your philosophy around that? Getting close to what we have versus sure. a lot of change and challenge and I don't think I don't think the ex, that level of of um, scientific recording is necessary. You know, I think what what we usually do in this type of project is we'll go out ahead with a contractor and we'll shoot a handful of greens, and it might be good. You know, a good task for your group might be to to answer this question: What are the three you know greens that don't work or too severe on your golf course, if there are any? What are the what are the three that are too flat and too boring? 
you know, and what are the ones in the middle? Um, that'll give us a, and then we'll go out and we'll, we'll shoot these greens with a laser and get the general ideas of what kind of slopes there are. Again, I have to adjust because the modern bent grasses are different than your grass you have now. Um, uh, a little bit, we're generally going to tone them down just a touch because greens just keep getting faster and faster. Um, but I think that's going to be sufficient. You, you do, you do that green scan it's called where they, they record the greens. So you do that on museum pieces like Pasta Tiempo, you know, or if you were working at National or something like that, where you just can't lose what's there. It's your job to, you know, to, to keep Alistair McKenzie's greens as, as close as you can. And so they have changed there. They have top dress buildup that's changed them quite a bit, but that's the process they're going to go through as I understand it so that they can replicate it again when they rebuild it in a USJ greens profile. The, uh, uh, a quick comment to share with this group. This goes back to greens and grounds circa 2015. We undertook an assessment of what it would take in time and money to convert the greens from foe to the and we had Bill Love, who was our architect at that time. And we spent a, a fair amount of time looking at all the specific greens. And what I took away from that, what was interesting is that take green number, uh, number seven, for example. He said, if you were to exactly measure this green, you know, with a level in transit, reproduce it exactly in bed fast, he said it would almost be unplayable. So we, we are going to have to make some accommodations and we'll have to leave it to the professionals to help us with that. But, uh, you know, for people that like our existing green, when you change grasses, we're going to have to modulate some of the slopes because the grasses will be faster. Yeah. So, if, but, if I may, if I may uh, interject something there, we, when we work at different uh, clubs, we don't typically get to pick the superintendent. I have no idea whether Chad's in the room or not, but uh, you're lucky. Uh, you're, I shouldn't say you're lucky, you're very fortunate to have a, a young man who is not only very committed to the project, but also is uniquely uh, connected and involved in all of our meetings. So Chad, Chad will have a role with Todd, not only in terms of what goes on in the construction of the golf course, but in terms of how he's going to maintain it going forward. And that's, I think, an important thing, because a lot of, lot of times uh, Chad's got a great relationship with Todd, and I think Todd vice versa. And um, I'm very happy about that. And, and Chad is, you know, we, a month ago, we were looking at Taro irrigation. And uh, it made a lot of sense because we had 800 relatively new Taro heads in the ground. But um, Chad went to Taro and he went to Rainbird, who basically are the two companies that make heads. Uh, and, and the total uh, uh, valuation of what works best, what, what, what does Chad like to work with, what's the most efficient, from a budgetary standpoint, from an operation standpoint, and we came out, I think, making a, a very, very good relationship and a very good deal um, with uh, with with Rainbird. So I just want to share with you again that um, you do have another kind of connection to this project through your golf course superintendent, and I, and that's always, I mean, again, we will be there, we will support you, and we will one day not be there, but Chad will be there. And what we leave behind, he has to be able to maintain. So I, I think that's an important uh, note to make. Yeah. <laughs> Lloyd, did you have a? Yeah, for Todd, um, you know, this property is peculiar in that it's a little small for a golf course and it rings around those condos and all that. And one of the features, this is going back to the thing about the back bunker. One of the features that always strikes me is we have these very rapid uh, elevation changes. Uh, over short horizontal space that terminate in the property line. So there's not much you can do about them. They're like from the full green to the property line up by 17 feet, you know, you're not going to be able to flatten that out or whatever. Um, so my question is uh, when it, we have bunkers that we don't like, that are back bunkers, we have bunkers in front of greens that seem too deep, and I think you thought were too deep. Uh, but they are part of function of this very rapid elevation change that we can't do much about. So my question to you is, uh, how we interpret the solutions to that will probably be, as you said, in the field. Will that be you here looking at the reality of those slopes and deciding how to relate the bunkering to the greens? Or will that be done by the shapers? 
Where's the art? Where's the art come in in, in solving that particular problem? Yeah, it's it's a combination of our direction and the shapers for sure, and then the edits that we'll make after the rough shaping. You know, we'll we'll be able to see with our eyes whether it's working or not. Um, so you know, I'm I'm confident we're going to get to something that looks right. You know, on your golf course, we're not going to have areas of transition or what we call tie-ins where, um, you know, it's awkward and not working. So at the end of the day, we want everything to be seamless. We want this to look like it's a golf course that was plopped onto the land that uh, was perfectly married to the land. And there aren't these sort of forced little areas, you know, that, that don't work where, you know, I will caution you where, where, golf courses and architects and builders run into those problems is when you're trying to get too much out of the golf course. So when you're trying to push a green back so far to get three extra yards or a tee back to get three extra yards, it, you're going to end up with slopes that look awkward and don't work and maybe aren't maintainable. So um, I'm much more of a fan of make it look right than try for those extra three yards. Um, that will be our direction. And hopefully everyone's on board with that. Hey, Todd, can you talk a little bit about the discussions that we've had, extensive discussions about playability for the golf course for all you know, types of golfers and what, what your philosophy is with regard to that? Sure, absolutely. Um, you know, that is one of our goals, for sure. Um, most projects we go in where the plan is viewed by the membership, the I say most, the, the immediate worry is, oh, this golf course is going to get so much easier, you know, based on what you're doing, you're removing trees, you're widening fairways, um, you're opening up some angles into greens. Um, we, you know, the, the key to countering that is in the details. It's in the slopes, it's in the, uh, the way, the shapes and the angles and things that we set greens and we set bunkers. Um, and so, uh, you know, I, I think we're going to achieve a balance. We're going it's going to become a more playable golf course for a lesser skilled player. And it's still going to have the teeth for the, for the more uh, advanced player. Um, we've been successful with that uh, on, on almost every project we've worked on, unless a club tells us we want to get much harder or we want to get much easier, which is rare. You know, generally clubs want to be what they are just much better. Um, uh, we, we feel very confident we can achieve that. And the playability that you talk about is going to come from different angles of tees. It's going to come from some tees moving forward, perhaps, or providing more forward tees. Um, it's going to come from the widths that we're creating, which has to do with trees and fairway widths. Um, the widths are really important for that, um, but they also don't necessarily make it easier for the advanced player because we'll start to design things more strategically where that advanced player, though the fairway might be 10 yards wider, that advanced player now needs to be on one side of the fairway to have the right angle in or the right shot in. Whereas in the past design, it did, really didn't matter. Um, so uh, I, that's kind of, those are some of the elements that I think you're gonna see. And I touched on opening up the entrances just to a variety of greens as well. Um, that will be part of it, allowing the ground game, allowing somebody hitting a rescue or a three wood to bound the ball in, or at least to play to one side of the green to then where the slopes will feed the ball in. That's another kind of minute detail that doesn't show up on plans. Can I, can I, can I ask a question? Sure. Hi, Todd, I'm Maude Scott. We have some women on this committee and we're all a little um, concerned that um, you men are kind of deciding <laughs> where the women are gonna play from. So can you talk a little bit about um, difficulty? I mean, our course is pretty hard for the women right now. Um, some of the women in the room could tell me, but our, our club championship, you know, their beautiful golfers are shooting an 85 or something. So um, can you speak about women's tees or, you know, what, what, what's for us? Sure, sure. Yeah, you know, ultimately we have a plan which has tees on the plan. And those are located in places where we think they set on the land well, the angles to the tee shot are well. Are, are, are where we want them to be, um, and to some extent yardages. Um, but ultimately, we don't set the plaques. You know, we're going to give you a variety of tees, and the plaques can go where they need to go. Um, and that really should be determined by operations, by the club. 
Um, and so I think there's always going to be a little flexibility there. We're going to have a set of more forward tees than you have currently that's shorter. Um, and so markers can always be moved up. We're also going to have a set that's roughly what you have today. And we're going to have a set that allows for them to be moved back as well. So I think a lot of that is TBD, you know, it's to be determined on where you, where they end up setting the, the markers or the plaques. Um, but otherwise, you know, I think we've, we've accommodated what you, what you're, what you're uh, referring to in, in a lot of regards with the plan. But uh, again, all of this is subject to adjustments in the field. You know, if we take a forward T from this hole and decide not to build it there, but to go build it over here, it generally doesn't cost any more money. The dollars are in the budget for that T to be constructed where it is really makes little difference unless we're, you know, working in the trees or somewhere where we have to do something extraordinary. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I would welcome, you know, you to be to evaluate the plan and evaluate the, the yardages and, and feedback would be fine that we could take that under consideration. Thank you. Sure. And I apologize, but I've got about five or 10 more minutes at the most. So I just wanted to kind of get that out there if there are any other questions so that we have adequate time to do that. I just have one quick question that's come up looking at plans. We're going to have, a, have another group look at by whole playability. Your uh, fairway bunkers, just, you know, your philosophy, you maybe lower those like number five, you go in there, that's that's a half stroke or worse. And a couple that you're thinking of putting in specifically 18, I think you're talking about a bunker on number 10 past the right oak. I mean, that's where, a correction on 11, that's where people bail out, you know? And so mm -hmm. Nobody wants to bail out into a bunker. So I'm, I'm wondering about the addition of the bunkers that you have in the plan now, it sure doesn't seem to to jive with playability of anything. It's making it really hard. Yeah, I, I'm not sure which, you know, we could go hole by hole, but um, yeah, in general, which I'll just give you my philosophy on fairway bunkers. They are important for the strategy of the hole. When we widen the width, fairways themselves, we want to create smaller, parts of these fairways and we want the fairways to move and not look like a big wide bowling alley and so bunkering is a very key part of that um, we also don't believe in dictating that fairway bunkers need to be at 285 yards off the tee on every single hole because that's formulaic and that's not the way great architecture happens if you look at all the great courses of the, of the 10s 20s and 30s they none of them followed that rule so that's was more of a design tendency of the 80s and 90s um, and so bunkers to us, uh, should go wherever the landform is that allows us to kind of check that box of creating smaller fairways within the larger fairway and creating angles and movement and strategies. So, um, that's our general philosophy. So that's why you'll see, we've even built bunkers a hundred yards off the tee, you know, on some golf courses, not on yours, but that's, there's a purpose to that sometimes aesthetically to create movement and to create uh, the goals or to match the goals that we're talking about. So, um, it's, uh, that's, that's kind of how we look at it. You can always go into every one little hole here and see this and see that and, 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 uh, you know, have a distinction there, but, um, that's how we look at it in general. I would also say, um, one of the examples you gave, we're considering moving it from one side to the other. And we've thought of that months ago. But there reaches a point where you need to stop changing the plans and the plans have to be bid and the contract has to be received by the contractor and we just have to stop. Um, but that's the beauty of, of the flexibility in the field, just like a T, a bunker can go from here to there at no additional cost as long as we're ahead of it. Um, so we will be making field adjustments and we're hearing everything you're saying. Um, it doesn't mean we're going to agree with everything, um, but um, hopefully we've provided you the general idea of how we look at things, and uh, and we will make adjustments when we think they're they're appropriate. Yeah, I tend to real hard now to look at that bunker on 18 you guys are thinking about. That's where a lot of people's second shot goes, and then that becomes dangerous because people can scald one out of there and send it right into the you know into the turn shack. Um, so you've got to be really careful on that one, putting that one back in. I, I don't think the second shot on 18 should be, you know, 
you got a bunker right there and you go in it, now you're 80 yards out. 80 yard bunker shots can go any, into the parking lot. <laughs> Todd, I have at least in my day. <laughs> Todd, question about the trees. So should we get this approval to take out all the redwoods and replant? Are you thinking mainly live oaks, valley oaks? What's your thinking on the types of trees in general? Yeah, that, that really falls to Ken Alperstein with Pinnacle. He's your landscape architect, but that was our initial direction was to plant natives, plant oaks. We have that wonderful aerial of the 60s when the course was, was new and uh, there was nothing out there but giant oaks. And so whether they're coast live oaks or valley oaks, you know, that's really up to Ken. Uh, we've talked about doing cork oaks as well. So we'll probably see a little bit of all three of those. That will be the main palette, I would, I would guess, um, with other types of species mixed in, but that will be the bulk of it. That's what's going to, and there's a reason for that. One, we want it to look right. That's your area. If you go out and drive around on the other side of the 280, you know, that's what you're going to see. Um, and, uh, and two, that's sustainable. You know, that's, uh, that's what wants to live here. That's what's going to do well for a hundred years. Um, and you know, who knows where droughts are going and what your water supply will be and all that sort of stuff. We, we, we feel good about it, but who knows in 20 years, 30 years. Um, so we want to plan appropriately to species that will live, uh, through those drought cycles. We do, uh, Ken has given us a we list show you exactly yeah. what yeah. Yeah. numbers. Yeah. Yeah. Oaks, I think it were five sycamores, 44. Yeah. Yeah, there's certain yeah. 60 oaks in the R3. Yeah, yeah. most most of the coast or with the live oaks that are not deciduous that are both both live oaks and so hey, Todd, can I go back to one other thing, which was a previous discussion about the bunkers and the fairways? And again, one of the things that people always complain about on number five in particular is that there's a pretty good lip there. And it's quite penal if you get into those bunkers. Could you talk about your philosophy of being able to play out of a fairway bunker and how you would actually design that? Yeah, that's that's a good question. Yeah, we generally you know have that in mind when we're building a fairway bunker that that's what it is. It's not a greenside bunker. So we want people to be able to play shots out of them. All of the floors of our bunkers, we're going to generally slope so that it's a slightly uphill shot. Um, that's another key distinction. A lot of architects build them more like cereal bowls where you can be in the first part of the bunker and it's a downhill lie or a flatter lie. Um, so we build them so that the slope encourages the exit shot and we build them generally longer um, so that the ball can settle in earlier and not go up against the lip. Of course, it can go up against the lip if that's where the ball's hit directly. But if it's on the ground, we want it to hit the early part of the sand and stop you know, well short of the lip. So you'll see them have a broader uh, length to them and a generally a lower lip height. And then that bottom uh, slope in the bottom is a key part of that as well. Great, thank you. Sure thing. Okay, what are your thoughts on, on uh, what the lake on number eight should look like? Are there any examples that you might have? That, well, right now we have a lot of stagnant water there. So I'm wondering if you want movement there. What do you, what do you want? To, and that, like I know Ken's doing that, but I'm just curious from your point of view. Yeah. The second question is for David is you said the sand level of five inches was optimal, but financially feasible. If money was not an object, would you recommend something different? Um, I'll talk to the lake yeah. first. Yeah. That's all right, David. Yeah, no doubt. Uh, and then I've got to run. I apologize. Um, but uh, yeah, the lake, again, as you mentioned, will be designed by Ken, and he has a lake designer as well, Rick McGuire, a uh, lake engineer. And, um, you know, they're really, really talented people. They've done a lot of lakes for us, and they've done hundreds of lakes, you know, throughout the, the world um, uh, very well. So I'm very confident in their design. As far as stagnation goes, um, we use uh, the common um, solution to that is uh, sub surface or, or uh, aerators that are placed at the bottom and they prevent the aeration uh, through the lake that will help with that. So, uh, but again, those, any of those te technical questions really should be directed at Ken um, as far as the lake goes. And then I'll pass it off to David. And if there are any other questions for me, I could take them right now, but otherwise um, I can take them remotely as well uh, through email or what have you. Okay, thanks, Todd. Thank you. Um,
Just to echo what Todd said, the uh, Rick McGuire as Waterscapes designed the lake. Uh, like Todd, we worked with him for a long, long time. Ken Alperstein, we've also worked with for years and years and years. But the company that's building the lake is called Cook and Solis, uh, and awfully talented people. I mean, they have built hundreds of lakes. They're kind of the go-to people, and they're creative, and they've got a nice shoreline, and, and, and the the the, uh, the 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 group did make a decision in, in the budget to add in some rock and cobble around the shore. So I think it's going to look really attractive with the combination of um, of, uh, of of plant material. As far as the trees are concerned, every one of those two hundred nine trees has been hand picked and tagged. Um, the, there's a drop box of you know that you can see the trees, um, and uh, I think the, the the variety from forty eight to sixty to seventy twos is terrific and. I think there are 50, 72 inch specimen trees, which are substantial in size. Um, going back to sand capping, um, you know, we sand cap anywhere from three inches to six inches. And we don't do it because of budget, we do it because of what the soil scientists tell us what we need to do after they send their soils to the lab. So um, with the bent grass fairways, um, we took the samples, we sent them off to the lab. Um, the process is we corro, which basically means we scrape off the top three inches um and uh separate the uh the, 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 the organic material from that so we have what is good material why is it good material because for a decade or more sharon heights had a fairly aggressive top dressing program and aerification program on the fairways so that's good stuff so the concept of stripping three inches uh from the fairways adding five inches of new sand uh is by design and, and as recommended by the scientists and also the agronomists. Uh, and then we take that good three inches of material, we take off the top of the fairways, we strip the top of the rough, which has not had such an aggressive top dressing uh, program over the last X number of years, and we use that material in that location. So we're using the good stuff from the fairway to put in the rough, and we're bringing in importing good stuff for the fairways, which obviously is where most of the uh, players from, but also uh, from Chad's standpoint, he's going to appreciate three inches of, excuse me, five inches of sand underneath his bent grass fairways. So that, that's kind of the logic there. And uh, if we had another million dollars, would we add another three inches? No, we wouldn't. Now, we asked the question, would we ask, would we add one inch? And, and the answer was no. Yeah. Did yeah, actually, five, yeah. Five inches is the is the is the labs and the scientists' recommendation, and uh, um, it's you know, frankly, uh, it's it's scientifically based as opposed to opinion based. David, could you talk a little bit about the uh, selection of the grasses and the the experts that you helped um, us bring in, um, so that you know, again, we we went into this without any preconception about what type of grass we should have in any section of the golf course and um, if you could talk about that I think that'd be good for the group yeah, yeah no surely again uh, going back to February this year um, there was not an agronomist on the project um, Chad had obviously returned back to the club he and I had some extensive discussions um, I think you start with one premise that where you are located you're going to work with cool season grasses because you're in cool season location in the United States so that you know takes away Bermudas and and certain other grasses which don't work in your part of the world. Um, so uh, again, based on, you know, we work with a dozen agronomists, maybe not, not uh, in America, but probably six in the United States. And there's certain agronomists who excel in certain parts of the country. Mark Mahadi is the uh, agronomist of record at Pebble and most of the Monterey Peninsula golf courses. Um, he's done extensive work with, uh, with the um, superintendents around your part of the world. And uh, when we brought Mark and Chuck Dixon in at the same time, uh, we talked about what were the goals and objectives of the club? What sort of grass playing surface did you want to, to play off? And um, the feedback was um, provided by, uh, not, not only by, uh, by, by, by the, the, the staff and the, and the management of the club, but also by the, the, the group of Mr. Duncan, Mr. Wozniak and Mr. Smith. Um, and that was fed to Ms. Mahadi. And, um, you know, we talked about a variety of different options and uh, the recommendation came back uh, to go with bent grass, uh, creeping bent grass. 
and also with ryegrass rough. And, and the great, the, the nice thing about it also is you're gonna have a really nice contrast in the color of bent grass, as opposed to um, uh, the color of the ryegrass, which is gonna be, I think, really uh, very, very attractive. And I, to Chad's, from Chad's standpoint, he's gonna be able to maintain the golf course, uh, I believe on an annual basis with significant less concern for disease. So I, it's, again, I think you sum it up one way. Your club went through a very thoughtful process, engaging the finest experts that we know of, and we listened to what they said based on your input of what you wanted. And that's how we ended up with the decision. And, and sand is the same thing. I mean, we, we heard about uh, input on sand. Uh, we got samples. Uh, at the end of the day, that's really Todd Eckenrow's choice of what the sand is. And there's combinations of sand. You can have 75, 25 kind of browny sand with whitey sand. They've obviously got technical names, um, but we ended up with a combination of sands, which Todd really feels is going to fit very, very well um, into, the, into the environmental appearance and beautification, coupled with the landscape and coupled with the trees and coupled with the grass selection. So all those things, that's when he gets artistic with his palette. So when you're talking about bent fairways, will those be comparable to Monterey Peninsula short course or what other courses around here? And those grasses are not susceptible to gray leaf spot, pythium. And I also understand you don't have to put nearly as many chemical products on bent grass as you do on rye. Is that true? There's some savings there on the maintenance or is that not true? Well, that is true, but here's what I would say. We, we had a call an hour and a half ago and I shared with Mr. Duncan, Mr. Wozniak, and Mr. Smith that my handicap on, on, on agronomy may be, I don't know, I think I said seven, it could be a five, and that's probably the same as Todd Eckenrode's. Uh, Chad's is a scratch or a plus one, and Mark Mahadi's a plus three or a plus five. So when, when, when we get questions about grass, we say, Chad, uh, if you're there, I don't actually know if you're in the room. But I prefer, I prefer for you to answer that because at the end of the day, that's what you do for a living is, is grow grass. Yeah, certainly fungicides and fungus we're, we're battling now with gray leaf spot and pythium. They're not going to be there with bent grass, but certainly bent grass opens up different funguses to gray leaf spot, more snowball activity, things like that. You can combat a lot of that with watering practices. So through water, driving water, watering deeper, and the sand helps us alleviate a lot of that. So it's not only in the grass type, but it's also the sand capital helps move a lot of the water through the profile. It then removing all the trees to get more light to the surface. So it's a combination of a lot of those things, not just the grass type. But yeah, Richard, so I, I think another piece that, that I'm wrong, correct me if I'm wrong here, but uh, in, when we're dealing so much with the, the great leaf spot with the rye, Right grass goes dormant once the temperature gets to about 75, 77, right. somewhere in there. But you know, we're clearly in days where we have much, much higher Not temperature. Well right now. So, <laughs> yeah. This hasn't been fun. So, uh, but I think Ben can tolerate much higher temperatures and maintain its growth. Right. So that's the challenge. When we get above 75, grass isn't growing, it's right. only dying. Right. So I think that Ben will be much So you won't have to aggressively treat the bed as you did the rye grass for the disease in terms of what or we have those specific diseases. Yeah, yeah, but ultimately no free run. Leave, yeah. <laughs> so, so uh, uh, cutting down yeah. all the trees and sand capping probably helps combat that disease wow. just yeah. as much as the dirt. Yeah. That absolutely helps. Um, and certainly there's gonna be a lot of other cultural practices that we're yeah. gonna do trying to keep co out of the air. Right. Sand capping will probably be a little bit more water. So there's pros and cons, but ultimately, you know, as, as David said, big grass was the choice by factoring it, everything the club wanted and uh, all the boxes we could check economically that was for this area. Yeah. And, I, and I think Chad's comment there about what's under the ground can't be overstated. It's so easy to gloss over what's going to be agronomically his foundation to grow grass. So he's going to have a wonderful platform to grow bent grass. I would tell you that we put rye grass in at Hillcrest. I don't know what the temperature difference is, but it's significant between Northern California and Southern California. Our rye grass at Hillcrest is doing well. We do flush it twice, three times a year with a potable water. Um, 
but I think that uh, to Chad's point, uh, not only is he going to be able to grow ryegrass, I think, effectively there, he's also going to have an irrigation system, which he's going to be able to, I, I wouldn't say lie in his bed at home and operate sprinkler by sprinkler, but it's almost that good. I mean, the advances in, 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 in irrigation are extraordinary. And, uh, you know, now he doesn't have that control. But with what he's going to put in this uh, in, in, in the ground or what we're going to put in the ground for you at Sharon Heights, um, it is really, really state of the art. And uh, the other thing you should also know, um, uh, we had a meeting last week uh, in Los Angeles regarding water. And just since that we've confirmed the bid for Sharon Heights, and it's fixed, it can't change. And uh, we are now 17% increase in the last 35 days of irrigation. 30, it's just extraordinary, I mean, it just never stops. So no time like the president and, and um, I'm delighted that, uh, that we've got it locked in and, and uh, you're gonna have an irrigation system that's gonna you know, certainly outlive most of us on this call. Hey, David, could you talk a little bit about the expert that we brought in to design the irrigation system in Brent Harvey, some of the projects that he's done and what your experience has been with him? Can I, uh, Dave, before you uh, uh, do that, but I just want to check everybody. My, we're, we're, we're uh, theoretically, we're supposed to end in 40 minutes and we got to go through a lot of updates and stuff. So, I mean, I want to go with where the group wants to go. If you find this valuable, I don't want to cut short about the status of the permitting and the budget and all that sort of stuff. So, I, I, I have I have eight minutes left before my call at 1030. Happy to answer that question, ring off and uh, and, and be led by the chairman. Um, to you. Brent Harvey, to Brent Harvey's point, um, it would be uh, it would be um, reasonable to suggest there are three or four major irrigation designers in the United States. Um, Brent Harvey is the professor. He's the leader. Um, we've done. 30 projects with Brent Harvey in, in the, over the years. Um, the key to Brent Harvey's success is not only in his ability to design, but he also gets it right in terms of the number of sprinklers. He got it wrong by three sprinklers out of 2,800 at Hillcrest. He got it wrong by 11 sprinklers overbid at Rancho Santa Fe. And you're talking about a, a, you know 2,000 to 3,000 sprinklers. So he gets it pretty right in terms of how many sprinklers we have, which is encouraging. But he also has a team of stakers. So what happens is that when Todd has got three holes ready, which are shaped basically, um, the irrigation will be uh, then uh, installed. And what will happen is a gentleman called Matt Harrington will come out with his staking team and stake the location of the sprinkler heads. And that's again, an art form of getting those sprinkler heads in the right place for the coverage that get adjusted in the field because you know you got to think about the trees, you've got to think about the bunkers, you've got to think about the elevations. So um, you know, uh, Brent Harvey is uh, is extraordinary, talented, and I couldn't be happier to be working with him. And again, again to be working with him. Another question. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, uh, so you mentioned that we have state of the art irrigation system, and maybe this is Chad for you too. With that comes technical difficulties, I'm sure. So with this system, do we have um, proof in the pudding, so to speak, at other courses? Yeah, I mean, first of all, Rainbird, uh, I mean, the reason we went with Rainbird, I personally, and again, I said they're both wonderful. Taro, Rainbird, at the end of the day, Chad's got to operate this. Um, technically, uh, I believe Rainbird is slightly ahead of Taro. Um, there are super, I mean, some people in the old days, you'd say some people drive Cadillacs, some people drive Lincolns. I think that analogy is gone now, but in the old days, there were preferences that way. And that's really where we are on golf course um, superintendents. Typically, it's about the support. Rainbird has great support in Northern California. But the, from a technical standpoint, Chad will, in addition to have, this is all run off the internet, but he also will have radio control. So if it all goes wrong and the internet goes down, he can still operate the irrigation system. So. I have no concerns about the technical standpoint of it, and I'm and I'm very very uh, encouraged uh, of the of the ability for this system to work. I mean, you've got you bought not a Lincoln, not a Cadillac. You bought a Rolls Royce. You have the best, and I don't know of anything better on the market. Thank you. Anything? Any one last question for David? We got. 
Thanks, David. Really, really appreciate it. Very helpful to everybody. Okay. Uh, delightful to be with you, gentlemen and ladies, and I wish you well and speak to you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. That's all.